Greetings, programs, and welcome to another episode of the Awesome Friday Podcast, the podcast where we talk about two new things every week, uh, usually movies, and in this case, both movies. Uh, my name is Matthew, and with me, as always, is Simon. Say hello, Simon. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. How, how are you doing? How's your week been? What's been oh, my the week's highlight? Been, my week has been super busy. Yours? Um... So work is kind of half busy at the moment. I'm not sure if that's a good or bad thing, but it's been just lots of stuff. But I have uh, had opportunity to um, <laughs> to listen to all the sirens in Vancouver. This is yep. just a normal. This is the song of Vancouver. Um, so I meant to mention this last week, but we were so marvelled up I didn't mention it. After our Stranger Things podcast, I started watching Stranger Things, and I actually oh, yeah. had I had started. Years and years ago, and I got halfway through the first episode and turned it off because a child went missing. And uh, at that time, I was, I, I'm very raw against my children going missing. Now my kids are a bit older and a bit more annoying. I'm like, oh, uh, they'll be fine. Um, so I watched in a week the first season of Stranger Things, and I thought it was amazing. I'm, like, really amazing. And I am 90% through season two of Stranger Things. I really wanted to finish it for this weekend, but life got in the way. And uh, the drop-off is quite impressive <laughs> between season one and season two of Stranger Things. It's like That's what? very true. I don't think season two is bad exactly, but uh, season two, I think, is the of the four seasons. Season two is the 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 lesser of the four. It's insane how it feels like it's all over the place. And there's a um, it reminded me of um, there's a season of Lost. I, I absolutely adored Lost. I'm the person who even liked the ending, but there's one season of Lost that's really, really bad. And it turned out years later, they basically said, yeah, we, we basically made it up episode to episode. We had no idea what the through, we weren't expecting to be renewed. And so we just made another season and it feels like that. It's so, it's so filled with interesting moments that are put together in the, in like the worst kind of way possible. It's really slap shot and haphazard. And even, even though you've got, wonderful moments like Paul Reisner um, staring at a screen while the alien sound effect, the, the motion tracker sound effect plays while all the aliens like attack the goodies. There's, there's lovely moments like that. And there's some like David Harbour is brilliant. I've never really seen him in anything before. He is. I don't know if he's this good in other stuff, but he Spoiler is. Spoiler alert. He, you've seen him. You've seen him in a ton of stuff and he's always great. <laughs> Have I though? Have I seen yeah. him in a ton of stuff? Okay. Yeah, I he's been around him. for quite a long time. Um, it's a Black Widow and... I saw him in. I can't really picture. I haven't seen the Hellboy remake that was meant to be terrible. But I can't really uh, think. He was like the least of that film's problems, though. Um, mm. So things you probably would have seen him in. Obviously, there's Hellboy. Um, he's in the 2016 Suicide Squad, Black Mass, e The Equalizer. Um uh, b b what else? Um, Who was he in Suicide Squad? Uh, he was uh, Dexter. Dex Dexter Tolliver, I think. Oh. Yeah. Okay. The main thing I remember him from, the first time I remember seeing him uh, and being like, that guy, I like that guy, mm. was in 2008. He was one of the, he was the CIA stooge in Quantum of Solace. Uh, and I, I really like. I'm, I'm the guy who likes that movie. So <laughs> do what you will with right. that information. But so say yeah. what you will. He plays the perfect smarmy dude in that movie. I, I have complete no with memory. smarmy mustache. <laughs> I have no memory of that whatsoever. Of that movie. Um, the movie's interesting because it doesn't. A lot of people don't really like it, but if you, if you think of it as like an epilogue to Casino Royale, it becomes a much better mm. movie. Which is, mm. because that's exactly what it is. It's a direct right, yeah. epilogue. Like, it's an extended epilogue to Casino Royale. It's all about Bond getting over Vesper, basically. Right. And uh, it's a much better film if you watch them as close to back-to-back -back as you're willing to do. Right. He's in um, he's in that show you like as well, Elementary. He's in an episode of that. Which yep. I didn't know. Yep. I should, I should really watch that. Here, I'm going to piss off a whole bunch of people. Elementary is a uh, better <laughs> than <Yeah>. Sherlock. <laughs> I love your hot take on Elementary. And you're probably right. Um, Sherlock definitely overstayed his welcome. Wow, he's done a ton of theatre as well. 
really good yeah. stuff. Wow. Yeah, cool. David Harbour is is really really good. I would have. Yeah. I know he was in a production of Glengarry Glen Ross a few years ago. I would have loved oh, to have seen fuck, that. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Anyway. Um, so anyway, I'm I am pushing through Stranger Things because I do hear it gets better. And honestly, the the motivating force to start watching Stranger Things is that I found out that in the most recent season, the end of season four, someone attacks the baddies by playing uh, Metallica's Master of, Master of Puppets over like mm-hmm. this red backdrop. And I've seen maybe three seconds of that and I turned it off immediately. And I'm like, okay, I want to get to that point because <laughs> mu- like music versus things is one of my absolute favorite things. So I'm like, I'm just going to have to go from the beginning to get the context for all of this. And yeah, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to spoil it for you but that is a pretty great moment. Uh, <laughs> I will also say as a person who's watched all of Stranger Things that Stranger Things season 3 is actually my favorite season of the four. Oh good. Okay, that's good. That motivates me more. I and mean, two, uh, it's it's yeah. also the most like especially after 2, it's a lot more focused. It's only 8 episodes instead of 10. Um mm-hmm. and it's very clear they had a plan from the beginning which Mm -hmm. as you're saying, it doesn't really feel like they did for season two. Um, And it also has the, I would say the scariest version of the monster. Oh, nice. Uh, And yeah, I, uh, I, I I really like season three. Is that your favorite season out of the four seasons so far? To be fair, I haven't seen season one basically since season one or two, basically since they originally aired and I've watched season three twice. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. We watched season three again in the lead up to season four. Uh, but yeah, I would say it's probably my favorite season. But cool. <clears throat> I think if I, I think my, that might change if I rewatched season one. But um, I could I could rewatch season three over and over again. I love that season of television. It's really good. Nice. Is that when my hawk turns up? Because she's fantastic. And I look forward to seeing her. Yes, she joins in season three. Excellent. Well, that's good. What are we talking about this week? We are talking about two new movies, one of which uh, we're going to talk about second, debuted on Netflix just this weekend, and another one that's coming out in theaters next week, on the t- or this coming week, on the 29th of July, the year of our Lord, 2022, uh, which we're going to start with. I just enjoy that I can say really random shit and have you laugh at it. <laughs> <laughs> that's always been the case, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it's my uh, delivery or just that you don't expect it or both, but like I, the look on your face when I say stuff that you know that harkens back to my history degree, basically. It's, so it's really there cool. is a there is a delineation in Canadian delivery and humor in people between people like American over the top neon signed humor, which isn't funny at all, and people who get British sarcasm. And when I when I like speak to a Canadian, I'm always thinking, which one are you? Like, if I, if, I, if I make if I make because I'm British, as you may have picked up from my accent, and so everything I say is sarcastic. My humor is only dry and only dark, and that, that turns out that doesn't travel here whatsoever because there is everyone you meet in the street is either going to be fully on board with like quick, dry delivery, English sarcasm, Monty Python, you know, every, all that good stuff. Or they're going to take you 100% literally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, um, and they'll see, th- they'll say things like, Oh, that's so funny. Like i not, not many things make my time, my teeth grind as someone going, Oh, that's so funny. Like I know. That's why I said it. <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole there's a whole Seinfeld episode where he dates a woman who never laughs and always says that's funny. And oh, really? uh, you should you should look that up. <laughs> I will watch that. <laughs> but so what I enjoy what I've already enjoyed about you is that you are on the sarcasm side of Canadian humor, and um, I, I enjoy how your mind works. Oh, good. Well, thank so you. There we go. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm flattered by the idea that it does. Uh. <laughs> And and I, it's always nice when you say something is quite good. I'm like, oh, you understand the difference between quite good and quite good. Yeah. <laughs> like, why why would we have that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like how the the greatest um, compliment you can give anything that anyone has done <laughs> in British English is yeah, not bad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's very much like the movie uh, we're going to talk about, right. which. <laughs> 
So uh, we're going to start this week by talking about a new movie coming out in theaters uh, later this week called Vengeance. This is the uh, directorial debut uh, of B.J. Novak, who you probably best remember as Ryan Howard on The Office, The American Office, The Hot Take Better Office. Um, oh, 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 oh. Wow. <coughs> I thought, yeah. is this in retaliation for my Marvel hot takes? <laughs> no, no, it's just uh, uh, the truth. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, briefest of plot synopsis. This is about a man who is basically B.J. Novak. He's a, a Brooklyn hipster writer for The New Yorker, Twitter verified, tweeter uh, writer. And he gets invited to a funeral for a woman who uh, died of an apparent overdose because his her whole family thinks that they are like an item and she is just a girl that he's hooked up with and he goes to this funeral and decides to turn his experiences there into a podcast uh with some pretty big ideas about being able to explore what it what america means through this death of this girl um it is i don't really want to say much more than that because it's that the rest of it's kind of spoilery um but I will say that I liked this movie, generally speaking. How about you, Simon? I know you're, you're probably not as much as me. Yeah, we talked about this briefly uh, in the week. It's the problem, My problem with Vengeance, I've got two problems with Vengeance. The first is that it's it feels really overwritten. Like, really, really overwritten. Um, I'm kind of allergic to people using extended anecdotes to get to the point they're trying to make. Uh, but that's the writing style that I've gone through as well. And I just yeah, that uh, doesn't doesn't uh, bother me like at all. My second problem is probably larger. I I find B J Novak borderline unwatchable as a performer. <laughs> like I, there is something about him, and it was the same in the office. Like he re- any episode he was in in the office was was tainted, and. I know he was a big producer. He was a producer, definitely a writer of The Office, wasn't he? And mm-hmm. and yep. I I found it very very interesting that Vengeance, in many many cases, sounded like an Office script that was trying to be a bit more emotional and serious. And for me, that didn't really work at all. But as a performer, I don't think it helps that he always plays like assholes. So Ryan in The Office was an asshole. And then he turned into a super asshole. And the guy in this movie at the beginning is an absolute, like, he, he starts with a duologue with his buddy about all the how they justify sleeping with lots of different girls. And you're meant to dislike him. I, I get that. but Yeah, I mean, I, he's not I, a good I, character, especially no, at the start of the movie. I, I find him <clears throat> just borderline unwatchable. And I don't know what it is, but I don't enjoy him as a performer. So it was a combination of that. And I'm I'm uncomfortable with City Boy finds humanity in Hicks, who turned out to be not as stupid as he thought. Like, I I don't enjoy that as a genre. So there were lots of things in this movie that didn't really work for me. And the ending's terrible, but we'll get to that later. We'll get to that in a bit. I don't want to go into too much spoilers, but... <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, most of the stuff in this movie... I think that you're saying is going to be either sort of not love it or hate it, but like, like it or not basically. And for most, for the most part, it worked for me. I thought that everyone in it is great. I thought I like BJ Novak. Um, he <clears throat> doesn't have a ton of variation in the characters that he plays, but that sort of works for the movie. He's meant to be unlikable. He's meant to go through a bit of an arc through the movie, uh, where he goes from unlikable to at least human. Um, the opening scene of the movie, which is him and John Mayer talking about basically how it's wrong to want to connect with people, I thought was really funny and on point for his writing style and his performing style. Um, it is kind of hard to separate him from The Office because I've watched, I've watched personally, have watched The Office like three times through. We're actually in our the middle of I think our fourth rewatch of The Office since the pandemic started. Because it's just so wow. rewatchable, um, and so it's like hard for me to separate was, him. The whole, the whole thing, or certain seasons? No, no, the whole thing. Wow. It's just, it's just so easy to throw on in the background. Like it's mm-hmm, and it's yeah. reliably funny, and I never get tired of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, but yeah, it's it's hard for separate, me to separate. Yeah. 
uh, BJ Novak from Ryan, and you're right, it does, you know, because he produced and wrote so much of The Office, this does have a very office feel to the way it's written, um, but that sort of worked for me. Um, I will say that I, I did like this movie, but it definitely bites off more than it can chew thematically. Mm-hmm. You know, it's trying to have, to say a lot about you know, in the same way that his podcast in the in the movie, he's trying to like record a podcast because this girl OD'd and his family, her family, are convinced that it's actually there's some foul play, and he's trying to make a podcast that has commentary about America. And the movie is trying to do that at the same time, and it, for the most part, it works for me. At some certain points, it doesn't. Um. And I think that's just where it's going to come down for you, right? It's either you're either going to buy in or you're not. I think that the parts the parts that work work like gangbusters. There is some pretty great satire of America, especially of the exact type of person that he's playing. Like his character Ben is like if you imagine the most insufferable Brooklyn podcast having hipster, that's who he's playing. Yeah, and the satire like him playing that character works really well but the satire of that character that type of person which i'm not gonna lie sometimes made me feel a little bit attacked but um (laughs) (laughs) um, that you know that all of that was pretty great and i really enjoyed the entire cast Uh, um especially uh jay smith cameron who plays uh the girl's mother and boyd holbrook is always great yeah he really is I don't think I've seen anything with Boyd Holbrook where I wasn't like, yeah, Boyd Holbrook is great. You know, like it's, he's, he's reliably good. Uh, And I did really enjoy that, you know, he goes every time just to further that point of him being sort of an insufferable person. Like there's a great scene right toward the beginning where he's sitting at like dinner with his family. And he mentions that he's only been to Texas once and it was for South by and the grandmother's like, Oh, what, what's, what, what for? And he's like, oh, South By is a festival. And she's like, no, what band did you go see? No one goes to South By just to go to South By. Like, every time that it, like, reaffirms that they're not just ticks, that they are fully formed human beings, I thought really worked really well. And it was mostly really sold well by the cast. Mm. My main problem with the movie, to be perfectly honest, is the ending. I thought it should have ended about, like, one sequence before it did. Uh, there's there's a there's a great monologue towards the end that is sort of like the realization of the main character's arc, and then the movie keeps going for like fifteen. Yeah, minutes. They, that's and, the really and, annoying thing. Yeah. And yeah, and like there's a great supporting turn from Ashton Kutcher, who is I, I know we don't really talk about Ashton Kutcher anymore. He's kind of like disappeared, but he is he's really good at delivering a certain kind of dialogue, and he's really good in his few scenes in this movie. Um. And there's a he delivers a monologue that I think is really on the nose in the ending, but I still think that ending should have been cut like cut like the, the movie should, definitely should have ended before it did is all I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. It's hard to talk about it without spoilers, but there's like a perfect thematic resolution and then the movie keeps going and that's a little bit disappointing. I, I absolutely agree. It, it did find a perfect ending and if it had just expanded on that moment, of realization because it, it kind of would have brought him full circle back to where he was. And uh, the story had been told by that point and it had a resolution that was fitting for the story. But then you've got this like tacked on event. I, maybe it's to justify calling it vengeance. I don't think it was the right name for the, for the movie, to be honest, because it, it, it was about different things. And it felt like that ending was so it could be called vengeance. And it and it it didn't feel. I mean, it, in a movie, I wasn't really enjoying anyway. It was mm. the ending that was so needless and overblown and uncomfortably, like awkwardly out of place. It just didn't work at all. Didn't need it at all. Yeah, which is a shame because I otherwise I enjoyed the movie. Like I say, my my general take is that it definitely bit off more than it can chew and goes on a little bit too long but very generally speaking i enjoyed it you know i uh, i thought that the all the stuff it was trying to do basically until the end uh it did reasonably well i don't think it's gonna win any awards or anything mm-hmm. like that but it's uh, it's it's a pretty pretty perfect three to five for me is this his first directed feature 
Yes, it's his, first, it's his directorial debut. Right. He didn't direct any of The Office. Uh, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that he... Yeah, no, this is his directorial debut. He wrote right. a ton of The Office, and mm-hmm. he obviously starred in The Office. Mm-hmm. Um... Oh no! Never mind. He did direct a bunch of The Office. He's directed a bunch of TV. He hasn't directed a film. This is right, his first so film. Feature, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, if I actually he 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 directed Scott's Tots, which is one of my favorite Office episodes. <laughs> that is good. The, I think he's got like he's got a good ear for dialogue, but I think he over overstretches it. And for me, the the reason why The Office worked were those. Uh, like it's the no laughter track cringe kind of humor where you sort of catch a, gl- a glimpse to direct to camera from Jim. I mean, Jim, Jim's sort of half look to camera perfectly underlines this kind of humor in his kind of writing. Mm-hmm. Right. And when you transpose that into something like vengeance, that's meant to be m- something more, I, it, it felt a little that style of humor. Cause there were a few moments like that that were quite funny but they kind of felt out of place for me but yeah i, I think that's, I think that's I, fair I, I think he'll grow like i i'm i would watch the next thing he writes and makes because i think he's got a good ear for it he's definitely got a good ear for a kind of dialogue and i would be really interested to see what he does next but this one didn't land for me yeah so i'm giving it a, a three out of five i guess you're giving it what i'm gonna guess it's a, two it's a, it's a middling two I, yeah. I really like Boyd Holbrook, like you say. I'm just, he's one of those actors where if he pops up, you're like, oh, Boyd Holbrook's in this. <laughs> like, I just, I just really like him. He's just, uh, it, and he's quite different between if you compare Logan to that, mo- what was that monster movie in a mansion with his terrible shifting British accent that sort of changed counties every every line? What was that called? Where he's oh, like a, yeah. mon- a monster hunter. The Cursed, I, really I think. Enjoy- the curse, right? So he would compare Logan to that to this. Like he's really varied, and he's got good range, and he's just very committed and watchable. So I really enjoyed him in this, and I think Ashton's great. I, I think he is an underused actor, and I think he's got some really good chops. But um, just as a package, didn't come together. Mm-hmm. I think that's a pretty fair take. I think, mm-hmm. uh, like, like I said, I think that. The parts of this movie that work for me outweigh the ones that don't, but I can totally get that it's not going to connect with everyone anyway. Uh, but I think it's definitely worth everyone giving it a shot. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, this film debuted at Tribeca back in June, and it is coming out in theaters, and presumably, I don't know when it's coming out on demand, but presumably it's 2022, so it won't be that long. Yeah, it won't be long for this kind of movie. Uh, um, but yeah, it will be in theaters on the 29th of July, uh, and it is R rated, but, uh, I think you should give it a try. I think, I mean, I think everyone should give every movie a try, but I think you should give this one a try. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, where we're at with Vengeance. We're going to move on now to our second film of the week, which just came out on Netflix. Uh, when you're listening to this on Sunday, it will have come out on Friday. Uh, and we're going to talk about the Russo brothers' new film, The Gray Man, which is a spy thriller with Ryan Gosling, Canada's Ryan Gosling, and Chris Evans. And Simon, why don't you give us a quick rundown on <laughs> this movie? Okay, I'm going to give you the entire story of this movie, which happens in the first two minutes of this movie. So I'm going to say some stuff, and none of it is a spoiler, because this movie is not at all concerned with uh, taking time with setup. Like, it's straight to the concept. Uh, Ryan Gosling is in jail, and uh, Billy Bob Thornton gives him an option. Come and work for us, and we'll get you out of jail. Come be a wet work, like, assassin, basically. And he says, okay, over some chewing gum. And then we cut to, like, 18 years later, I believe, and he is on a hit, which goes a little bit sideways. And during this sideways hit, it turns out the target is someone else in his secretive assassin guild and he's got a a little usb drive with some secretive stuff on it that uh, he asked ryan gosling to uh, take a look at and you'll know the truth now this sounds like i've revealed a lot this is first 10 minutes maybe 
yep. and then the rest of the movie is stunt to stunt and your opinion on whether you like this movie is how you feel the stunts were choreographed and filmed and in a way it kind of reminded me of um extraction with um Hem- hemsworth hemsworth yep right which was a movie that purely existed to show like fancy drone camera work and stunt to stunt i didn't like extraction this worked a lot better for me but it's basically ryan gosling is causing chaos the agency sends in this like lone gun other assassin that they can't really control played by chris evans who is brilliant in this movie and mm-hmm. basically chris evans has no rules has no he will listen to no one he will do whatever it takes to get his mark and so it's ryan gosling and anna Darmas versus chris evans basically in a bunch of different cities with a bunch of different stuff blowing up and that's really the synopsis of the movie have i left anything out I mean, the only detail you've left out is that Chris Evans is a private contractor, and which is why the CIA can't control him. And uh, Ryan Gosling is a Sierra agent who doesn't exist. Um, but, like, that's all neither here nor there. We've pretty much run the whole thing down. Like, Ryan Gosling has information. The bad guy, like, the evil operations chief of the CIA needs that information because it's about him, and he sends Chris Evans to get Canada's Ryan Gosling, and it's just a chase <laughs> and a bunch of bunch of stunts. And uh, I like how he's kind of just, Ryan Gosling. Well, according to federal Canadian bylaws, <laughs> that is how we refer to <laughs> the baby goose. We can call him Canada's Ryan Gosling, or we can call him the baby goose. Those are it's like the it's like the Quebec language laws. This is it's like that. Same Ooh. with um, Vancouver local Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> you know, it's uh, there's specific ways we need to refer oh, to things. Beautiful. I learn every day. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I uh, did you like the movie though? I mean, like, I think you actually liked it more than I did, and yeah. I thought it was fine. So the I went into this movie with a little trepidation because I'm not a, not a huge fan of the Russo brothers uh, Marvel movies. I don't think um, that we've we've talked at length before, probably on the podcast actually, about their framing and editing of action, and yeah, we've how, definitely talked about it before because I and, don't like it. How, and how we're we're both partial to pulled back passive cameras allowing us to see the actual fight. And we've talked about this in relation to Star Wars or MCU, all kinds of different things. So for the first half of this movie, I was pretty much blown away. I loved the first half of this film. Absolutely loved it. I thought the action was framed really intelligently. I loved the stylistic choices. There's one extended plane sequence where there was no... Uh, dramatic background music it just took its time to show this plane sort of uh, uh, unraveling piece by piece and it's shot very cleverly um, I love 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 Chris Evans like he he is the smarmy mustachioed uh, dangerous person and and he is a great actor he is very able to do this kind of dark kind of character and I, I really like Ryan Gosling <laughs> Ryan Gosling, I saw one review that said Ryan Gosling looks um, like he's just tired. He doesn't want to be there the whole time. But what I love is that he is so highly trained. Basically, when people run at him with rocket launchers, the first thing he does is like is like roll his eyes and like, oh, God, do I have to do this right now? And he's handcuffed to a bench and he can't reach the guy. He's like, okay, all right, just give me a second. Like, he is brilliant in this because he is not like your know, John yeah, McC- he's- McCain. Yeah, he's basically nonplussed by everything that yes. happens in the movie, yes. which is kind of oh. a brilliant. It's kind of a brilliant choice to be honest. Like he is meant yeah, to be, yeah. he is meant to be like the most highly trained of the most highly trained people. And instead of being like, "Oh shit, stuff's happening," he just acts <laughs> as though he's really highly trained. It's kind of like whenever you watch a movie where there's a guy in the army who, when like an alien, like there's a fight breaks out, and some army sergeant goes like, "I didn't sign up for this shit." It's like, no, actually this is exactly what you signed up for. And I really enjoy that Ryan Gosling's character, Sierra six um, is basically treats everything like exactly what he expects to happen. It's it's a really, it's a really smart choice. And I think that, I think that Gosling is, is very good at it. Yeah. I mean, there's one wonderful moment where he gets stabbed with like surgeon scissors and he pulls them out. He's trying to dress himself. And he's just like, Oh, well, he missed the liver and the kidney. What an amateur. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Nothing to himself. And um, yeah. I love that tone. So the f- first half, I was totally on board. And 
I do love um, that they call it out in like the first scene. That first, that first, you know, set in two thousand three when he's first being recruited and he's talking to Billy Bob Thornton. And at one point, Billy Bob's like, "I get it, you're glib." <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Here is the definition of your character. Yeah. Um, the uh, but there's a uh, as a sequence with a tram that marks the halfway point where suddenly the editing starts getting really frantic. The camera starts getting a lot closer and it leads to a resolution that is not good. Like the ending is not good. And I would love to know if the second half of this got really rushed because I was so on board. Like it was a high four out of five until things started going downhill. Yeah. I but disagree I want, want entirely. Think? I think all of the action was pretty bad. Um, <laughs> and it, it all, it stems from the same reason that I don't like the action in Captain America, the Winter Soldier, um, or Civil War. Um, so my basic thesis about the Russo brothers is that they are they're bad action directors. And I think that they're perfectly competent directors of everything else. They do not have a lot of style. Like, they don't have a lot of uh, flash. It's just very workmanlike. And that's not a bad thing. But they're very workmanlike directors of actors. They're very bad directors of action. And Infinity War and Endgame, both of which I like a lot, are only as good as they are because of the cast. And this movie supports that thesis to me. Mm. Um, all of the action in this movie, to me, is it shoots too close, it cuts too fast, and even like that sequence on the plane that you mentioned where the camera is a little more passive and does shoot a little bit longer takes, the angles are too low, and then they release a bunch of smoke into the air, so you can't actually see what's happening. I think that's a really interesting point, because that same sequence we talked about, I love it because the camera was low, the smoke is there, and you can only see the legs. And it's just about how you're going to... What kind of art is art for you? Like, you you hated that because it was too low, and you could only see the legs with the smoke. I loved it because it was low and you could only see the legs because of the smoke. And I guess what really frustrates me about that, though, about all of this, and this again, this applies to, I think especially, there's one fight in particular in The Winter Soldier, and it's the, the first one where Captain America first fights the Winter Soldier in the, on the highway. Yeah. And what really bothers me about it is that you can 100% tell in this movie that Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans put in the work to learn fight choreography to really get it down really precisely and then they shoot it so they shoot it so poorly you can't actually see what's happening are you talking about it, any like their final fight uh so the, i have problems with their final the final fight in the movie for a bunch of reasons and but yes mm -hmm. that is one of them mm -hmm. but like almost every fight in the whole movie is like that like the the and the scene you're talking about with the with the tram like there's a scene a part of that in that whole sequence where the tram is moving through an intersection and a car gets blown up and you get to see that car blow up and crash from three angles in about two seconds mm -hmm. and it's just emblematic of the way they shoot action and i and i hate it and there's this another scene right before that where he's in the middle of a square in prague and he's chained to a bench and someone like drives the car toward him and he only barely escapes but it cuts so fast that you don't actually get to see him escape. <laughs> like it's, it's cutting so frantically that the, the beats of the action, like the, the like bare minimum for you to understand what's happening is there, but the minimum for you to like follow the flow of what's happening is not. And I find it really, really frustrating. And the, the first scene where Gosling and Evans actually have a confrontation, which is earlier in the film, which you can find a clip of online. It's on Netflix's YouTube, but there's a, it, the first time they meet face to face and they have a couple of great lines of dialogue, but even the fight leading up to that scene where Gosling is tearing his way through a bunch of different minions. And that one is actually kind of refreshing because uh, it's longer takes, it's a steady mm -hmm. angle and it's a steady cam, but then they shoot it from behind the people he's shooting that he's fighting. So you can't actually see what he's doing. You can see that he's like, has a couple of knives and he's going to town and he's clearly put in the work again to learn all this choreography, but they shoot it with a person in the way the whole time. And it's really frustrating because I just want to, I just want to watch it, man. Like I just, I just, I just want you to put the camera to the side. And let me see what's happening. 
That's mm. all I want. That's all I want from an action movie like this. Basically, I want every movie to be shot like John Wick or The Raid. I want you to pull the camera back. I want you to teach the people the choreography, and I want you to let me watch it happen. And this movie doesn't do that at any point. You see, I just I disagree with like half of that. I think the the points that you picked out about the car crash on the tram, and the uh, I'd say actually when they drive the van into the park bench and he just escapes, I would say that is the moment where first half becomes second half for me because the Mm -hmm. editing i know exactly the car crash you're talking about and it is terrible it's the police car right and it's you see it do the same thing three different times in about one second and um the but before that you know the fight you're talking about with the passive camera uh, i think we're actually talking about the same thing except the person in the way didn't bother me and there's a flashback scene where he he fights um some dude protecting the the niece in a mansion and the camera doesn't move and it's him and the stunt man punching blocking punching blocking punching blocking like four or five times over and yeah, that one's pretty good and actually the, and, and that was fantastic and i feel like the first half that was the level of the action and then maybe by choice maybe they thought they were trying to accelerate towards the end by increasing the cuts or whatever they decided to do from that car crash from the tram onwards just uh did feel like a, a different kind of movie actually a different kind of edit and different kind of directors even um and i I, they... I i have exactly no insight into how the russo brothers think but my my guess and again totally uninformed i i don't know them i don't make movies myself but my guess is that they think that fast cuts gives like a um it makes everything feel faster it makes mm-hmm. everything feel but to me, it just ends up feeling rushed, which is a, a different thing. You know, yeah. Like... Yeah. No, I know what you mean. It is it is a shorthand used by many, many directors, and I don't think it works as well as they think it does. The the uh, That's why I, I can't watch the Bourne movies, the Matt Damon Bourne movies, because everything is tight cuts and, and hyper edits, and uh, I, I find it unwatchable. I can't follow, I can't track what's going on. I think and, and the, the, for me, the difference with the Bourne movies, and I know this is not all of them, but the difference is that the Bourne movie employs, you know, was the movie that basically made the shaky cam, the handheld cam popular. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But at the very least, that's kind of because the cameras try and move to keep up with them. Like the shots are at least longer. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas mm-hmm. a lot of people's interpretation, a lot of other directors employ the shaky cam and they cut. They cut too frequently is what it really mm-hmm. boils down to. I can deal with the shaky cam as long as they don't cut away from stuff all the time. And it just, it really gets to me. Because mm-hmm. I like, we're, I think we're, it's it's a little bit, I don't want to talk about it right now just yet, but when we get to talking about the big final confrontation between Gosling and Evans, I have a lot of other thoughts about it, but that's another great scene that like you can tell they did the work and then it just cuts so much that it's hard to follow. Mm-hmm. And outside of the choreography, there was no resolution at the end of this movie. They had to find something for poor Jessica Henwick to do, who's this like third wheel. Like they, she, her whole character arc needed a, a just a total overhaul. And the I mean, this the movie's res- a, a pretty terrible waste of both Jessica Henwick and I would even argue Anna de Armas. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I would agree. She's, um, yeah, yeah. I think you know. So Gosling and Evans are great. I actually really enjoyed. Billy Bob Thornton, even though he doesn't have a mm-hmm. ton of screen time. Yeah, no, he uh, the there's a young girl who plays Billy Bob Thornton's uh, niece, mm-hmm. uh, and her name is uh, what is Julia her name? Butters. Julia Butters, which you probably recognize her because she was the young girl actress in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and so I've seen her in two things, and she's been great in both of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I don't think that. Uh, and I'm going to mispronounce his name, but uh, Regé Jean Page, um, mm-hmm. Anna de Armas, or Jessica Henwick are bad actors. I just think that they are, like, it's a waste of their talents, given how little yeah. they're given to do. Um, well, Regé Jean Page I thought was great. I've never seen him as an antagonist. I thought he he had a really solid accent as well, and he was really watchable. But uh, for, for the movie exposes him as the central bad person 
And then, spoiler alert, there's not really, he doesn't really get any kind of comeuppance at the end. Like, the, the resolution yeah. is completely off focus. I do wonder, because I know that like it's like a stated thing in the marketing that this is intended to start a franchise, and I right. wonder if that's why. They, you know, they need to keep a bad guy around for the next movie. Um, but you're right. I mean, yeah, the way the way it resolves is not. It is kind of tidy in a sense, but it's not satisfying. Not at all. Not in the slightest. It's really and weird, actually. yeah, so, but also just a total side note. Just sticking with the cast for a second. You know who is great? Danush, as the lone wolf agent. Um, like yeah. another. Like he has such a, an interesting on screen presence in chemistry, and I hope that we see more of him in Western cinema. Uh, where, where, where have I seen him before? Uh, I don't know. Let's quickly look him up. I don't know if I have seen him anything before. I kind of recognized him. Uh, I mean, he's a big. He's a he's a star in India. Like he is a right. he is a a star of Tamil cinema. Um, but I don't know if I've seen him in anything Western. It did amuse me that the end of his arc is choosing to move forward with honor. Like there's limits he won't cross. Like the honorable Tamil fighter, I thought was a really interesting choice for him. Yeah, it was a nice juxtaposition to uh, Chris Evans, mm -hmm. completely amoral character as well. Yeah. Especially, yeah. w there's a moment where uh, Danish's character realizes exactly who he's been working for, and it's it's a really well executed mm -hmm. moment. I thought, mm -hmm. but I think that just comes back to my thesis that like the Russos are pretty good at, at getting decent, like in good performances out of their actors. They just they're mm -hmm. kind of like this movie has a ton of drone cinematography in it too, and I just don't think they have the flash to pull that off. Mm -hmm. Like, they don't have the, for lack of like a better it. word, they don't have the, like, creativity to do anything than, like, establish the most direct path for a drone to fly. <sighs> right? I don't know if you, did you ever see Ambulance? No, no I was so, going to say, you're, you're comparing this to Ambulance, though, aren't you? I am, and the reason for that is that when Michael Bay discovered drones this year as well, um, but the way he approached it was... He's like, shit, these drones can do amazing things. And so he hired a world champion drone racing team to shoot his drone stuff. And they do, like, the cinematography does all kinds of bonker shit with those drones. Whereas in this movie, it's pretty much limited to a, 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 re a perfectly good tracking shot that starts under a bridge and ends with a flyover of a city. It would be a crane shot. It would be a stitch crane shot, but they just did it with a drone instead. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, and then there's there's one one long take uh, with a drone that is pretty good, where it sort of circles around a courtyard and catches three different characters in three different stages of action. And there's, but that's also again, it's part of a larger sequence. It's one cut that if they had kept the drone going for a while and just managed to choreograph all that action would have been amazing but instead it's like three medium shots instead of one long one and again they just they just lack the flash to make that interesting mm -hmm. you know they're not racing up the side of the building doing a 180 and coming down and then going underneath an ambulance as it passes by. like <laughs> they just don't have the the, the Russos just don't have the style to make that as interesting mm -hmm. as it could or should be Mm -hmm. and it really sounds like I'm picking this movie apart but honestly it's fine it's totally fine it's probably the best one of these like 200 million dollar action movies that the Netflix has produced so far oh yeah for sure for sure definitely like, it doesn't look, it doesn't look like a typical like low budget Netflix thing it looks good it I mean it looks good. it also like if you're going to compare it to other things of the same <laughs> ilk like I was thinking about this yesterday in that I didn't think the movie was great, but I'm gonna I'm gonna end up giving it a three out of five. But I think it's better than Red Notice. But I think I yes. think like ret I think retroactively I, w I wouldn't I wouldn't bump this one up to four to give it a higher score. But I would retroactively bump Red Notice down. What did you give Red Notice? I thought it was fine. I give it a three out of five. I looked it Ooh. up. Yeah, Again, yeah, but it's another one where like it sort of it's sort of coasted on the rock and. 
like all yeah. the, the chemistry and the charisma of the stars, right? Yeah, so this is this is much better than Red Notice. So this is, I mean, it again, it sort of coasts on the chemistry and the charisma of its stars, and that's sort of fine. I doubt I'll remember much about it in a couple of days. You know, I've I've got a slightly more positive take. Like the first hour is incredible. And then if you're okay with the more frenetic pace of the second half, then definitely watch it. Um, you're, you're not going to find the ending satisfying. My, my barometer is my wife. Like she watched it with me and she, by the end, she's like, well, it's just, uh, and earlier she was making, I said to you, Matt, when there's one point where Ryan Gosling takes his shirt off and I think it was a prosthetic body because I've never seen like a book, like, and my wife made a noise like air escaping a balloon, like really slowly. <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> and um, so she, the first hour was a, a good one, but um, it's kind of frustrating for me to, to especially get to the end and not have a good action resolution to that action movie. But it makes sense, the thing you're saying, if they want to position this as a franchise. I mean, there's always more bad guys. They could have got another, like whoever's pulling his strings could have come in, but um, uh, the, you're not going to find the end satisfying, but I still would recommend it. It's a really high, like it's a solid three for me, but it was almost a high four. And that kind of disappoints me. Mm -hmm. I will say too, that like <clears throat> there is a big last action sequence in which Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans, you know, have a face to face where they toss away their guns and decide to fight. <clears throat> And I've already talked at length about how they cut action and how it doesn't serve the scene at all, but also thematically and in keeping with each of their characters, that fight just shouldn't happen. I mean, it's it's kind of too spoilery to get into, and I might talk to you a bit more about it after we finish recording, but <clears throat> they spend so, t so much time building up Ryan Gosling as this like unstoppable secret agent who can cut his way through anyone he wants. And they spend so much time with Chris Evans establishing him as a smarmy, amoral, and every time he has a chance to fight, he just shoots the guy. Every single time mm -hmm. until the end. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no buildup or reason for him to be, to have an extended fight sequence at the end. And it, I mean, he has it, got that line where you want to prove he's better, but I, I take what you're saying. Yeah, but it's so, like, it doesn't matter by that point. Like, there's, at no point is there any indication that he's going to be any good at fighting. At all. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like the reason that fight exists is strictly to give them a fight together. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's to serve the, for lack of a better way to say it, it is to serve the actors, the star power of the performers, not the story of the movie. Like, it would have made more sense for Chris Evans to, for them to start that fight and for him to be really cocky and then to be kind of just defeated really quickly because he's actually just a cocky asshole. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, no, absolutely. Uh, but that's not what happens. No, so. it's definitely, the the scene preceding that is pretty cool. And then from that moment, that's really the beginning of the film's resolution and it does it just loses it completely. Yeah. Neither, Although neither. there is one of my favorite moments in the whole film, though, comes right before that when, uh, and I don't want to spoil it, but there's a great line exchange between Gosling and Butters um, that I really, really liked. That's a really nice callback to an earlier yeah. part of the film. Yeah, yeah, that's done really well. Uh, but then, yeah, then the resolution is just bad. Yeah. Okay. So, but, so yeah. I liked it. Watch it. Matt's I, yeah. I thought it was fine. You should totally give it a try. You know, the one thing about Netflix is that if you want them to keep making $200 million action movies, you have mm -hmm. to watch the $200 million action movie. Mm -hmm. And again, I think this is totally worth watching for Evans and for Gosling. Yeah. Um, it's, I just don't, I think it's fine. It's totally fine. It's fine. Mm -hmm. It's totally fine. <laughs> it's adequate to the task. <laughs> cool. So what's coming up on our next week then? I have absolutely no idea. I haven't had All time. Right. To so stuff, there'll be something. Um, but uh, we will have to figure that out. So. We were going to talk about covering Resident Evil, the TV series, at some point. Like, maybe that's something we could do. We could do that, although apparently it's not great. Yeah, and but I... this is what we talk about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. We'll see. 
there's a there's a lot of stuff happening. Fantasia Fest is happening right now too, so maybe we can put together some stuff from that. But maybe I'll just question you about No Thank You, which you're going to go and watch very very soon. And that's I true. To, Next week, with any luck, we will we will be covering Nope because that is coming out uh, at the time of recording this today. Um, but yeah. Uh, other than that, I think we're gonna cut it there because you know that's that's the end of our show. I do have anything to say <laughs> yes. to the. It's <laughs> a good. That's a really good reason to stop, isn't it? It's I know, right? The end. Uh, so yeah, Vengeance is in theaters on the 29th of July. Um, I recommend you give it a shot. Uh, Simon thinks it's probably better for VOD. Uh, to put it politely. <laughs> yeah. Um. And uh, The Gray Man is on Netflix now, so go watch it if you're inclined for that sort of thing. Simon, do you have anything you want to say to to anyone about anything? Oh, about anything? Well, um, let's see. Um, no, thank you for listening, and also thank you for listening to the game podcast as well. I'm having a lot of fun making those, and uh, suggestions, if there's anything you want us to play or watch, or uh, when we covered RRR, we got tons of suggestions from um people who are really well versed in that kind of cinema and it's really exciting to me to be told about things i don't know so if you've got any film or game suggestions that um based on what we talk about if you think we'd be interested in or if you'd like us to cut to cover then please we'd love to hear from you and thank you for listening yeah uh so that we're gonna wrap it up there thank you so much for listening uh as always if you like the show if you like what you've heard please consider giving us a five-star review on your podcasting platform of choice. Uh, like us, subscribe to us. All of these things help in an immeasurable way. Um, if you'd like to support us more directly, we do have a Patreon uh, and a Kofi, and those will both be linked in the show notes, but it's patreon.com forward slash uh, MC Simpson, I believe. Um, I should always know this, but for some reason I don't because I'm really bad at Patreon. So uh, yeah, MC Simpson. Um, if you'd like to reach out, you can find us on all the socials. We are, but our main one is on Twitter, which is at Awesome Friday CA, uh, or you could email us at comments at Awesome Friday, and we'll get that too. Uh, we produce this on the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Slay with Tooth and Squamish Nations here in Vancouver, BC. My name is Matthew. That has been Simon. Thank you so much for listening and joining us on Awesome Friday. Bye.